Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Shannon Olson. I will be moderating this first talk session. We will have four very exciting talks for you this morning, and we'll be doing this over Slack as we did with the uh, keynote session you just joined before. How this will work is that I will be introducing each of the four speakers in a few minutes, and then they we will be showing their videos uh, over this channel. And you can direct your questions to each of them on the Slack channel. In this case, the Slack channel is um, at day one, 28 September talks AM. And I'm also at the same time going to be posting in the Slack channel in just a minute here, the uh, the names of the speakers. So you can actually make sure to direct your questions just to them and not, you know, not to, to anyone in the channel. So we can keep that organized a little bit. I'll, I'll be putting that in the Slack channel. And I will just stop talking for a minute or two here, and then I will come back on to start introducing the main speaker. So I hope this gives everyone enough time to join the YouTube channel. And I hope you're all joining us and watching this, and we will be starting officially in uh, three minutes. Thank you. For those of you who are watching us, I hope that you are already at the Slack channel and you're ready to watch the uh, the show either on YouTube or directly through Slack and you will be able to listen to each of the talks. Please do post your questions there, highlighting the names of the different persons. Um, and then ask, we will try to ask as many questions live as possible, just as we did with uh, with Gita. Okay, so it's now time to start. So I will be introducing our first speaker for the morning. This is Krishna Garish. Krishna is an undergraduate student at ISU Pune. He's currently working on a project to quantify upslope shifts in response to climate change in Himalayan birds using citizen science data. And the title of his presentation is Preliminary Evidence for Upward Range Shifts by Eastern Himalayan Birds. I hope you enjoy the talk. I am really sorry to interrupt. I think we have audio issues. Just give us just a second. We will start uh, Krishna's talk um, again in about a couple of seconds. 
This is our first uh, first round of doing this. So thank you for being patient with us. We are also in, in theory have practiced this all, but it's one thing to practice and another thing to be doing it for real. So I expect these things will happen at least for the first day. Please bear with us. And thanks for tuning into my talk. I'm Krishna Girish, a second year undergraduate at ISA Pune. Hello everyone, and thanks for tuning into my talk. I'm Krishna Girish, a second year undergraduate at ISA Pune, and today I'll be presenting my work on detecting preliminary evidences for upslope shifts in East Himalayan bird species using citizen science data, a project I've been working on with Professor Umesh Srinivasan of IIC. Let's get started. First of all, this presentation wouldn't have been possible without so many people and organizations. And I'd like to take a moment to thank all of them. 
the Biodiversity Collaborative, first of all, for this wonderful opportunity and exploration into making citizen science better and what it can do for us in return. Ebert for being such a wonderful venture and enabling this project to exist. And all of us, the citizen scientists, who entered data of the birds they saw, without whose contribution our study could have never happened. Climate change has been shown to have a profound effect on several aspects of ecosystems. One study shows that as many as one in every six species are at risk of extinction due to global warming, with local extinctions already observed in some species based on their historical distributions. One of the ways that species could respond to environmental changes could be changes in phenology or their annual movement cycle, generating asynchronies with other related processes and affecting populations. There could be a greater need for thermoregulation to remain cool as it gets hotter, affecting its ability to find food and hence its survival. Another fundamental way by which species of all kinds respond to a warming climate is to track their geographic ranges, possibly to track their thermal niche, the range of temperatures optimal for their survival. How could this range shift actually happen? It could be poleward shifts, moving out of warm tropical areas towards cooler regions, or in mountain areas, these shifts could happen okay, upslope, uh, tracking so temperatures again, along the elevational gradients. For the slight technical but particularly worried about try to restart the talk again. So I will just reintroduce. species in tropical mountains due to their limited thermal niches. Here's a diagrammatic representation of what could happen with an increase in climate in tropical mountains. Hello? Suppose some species, say the Bugunlai or Sikla, has a limited elevation range of 2000 to 2600 meters. As the temperature warms, the habitat within its range becomes less and less suited to the existing thermal adaptations the Lyosikla had. Hence, with the passage of time, and the warming of the climate along the mountain, the natural response of the Lyosikla would be to move upslope into areas it's better thermally suited to. Populations could dramatically collapse as they're squeezed into progressively smaller and smaller areas fitting their thermal requirements since there's less room at the top. Finally, with enough upslope shifts, the lower edge of the species range may exceed the maximum height available, leading to a mountaintop extinction. These upslope shifts have been studied based on historical transects and modern day ranges for birds in Peru and Papua New Guinea, and in various other sites for a wide variety of taxa. These studies show indubitably that whole mountain communities are marching in lockstep towards the summit and towards their eventual death in a process termed as the escalator to extinction. Why is this of particular concern to us? Here's a heat map of diversity of birds around the world. Hotter areas, which are closer to yellow or red in color, have higher diversities, and the areas in blue are colder with lower diversities. As you can see, the mountainous regions of the world, be it the Himalayas, the East African mountains, or the Andes, all have disproportionate numbers of bird species. Upslope shifts could endanger all of these and cause extinctions across the planet in a warming future, leading to a massive loss of biodiversity. Now, what's our research about? Our goal was to see that if this pattern of upslope shifts of bird communities was in fact true in other tropical mountain systems, specifically the Himalayas. The warming rate in the Himalayas is three times higher than the global average. This could cause sweeping changes to the Himalayas' rich biodiversity in the near future. Also, understanding more tropical upslope shifts may allow us to make more informed and targeted conservation decisions. For our study, we chose the bird populations of Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary in Arunachal Pradesh. This is a protected area with a very high diversity of birds, as you can see in the map. Since it's largely protected from land use change, this is also an ideal place to study the effect of climate change on the ranges of mounted birds, and to see if the trend of shifts seen in past studies is also seen here, and if so, how the rates compare. However, there is one big caveat here. The immediate problem that we ran into was that we did not have the field data of eagle nest birds at different elevations. Beginning this now using field studies would take many, many years before having enough information to show results, by which time the entire structure of communities of organisms in eagle nest may have completely changed. Other studies of upslope shifts have used historical transects. Unfortunately, we don't have that either for eagle nest. What could we do? As you may have guessed based on the theme of the conference, of course, we turn to citizen science. We found data entered by birdwatchers and eBird from Eagle Nest dating back to as far as 2006. This constitutes an invaluable resource. We can now measure how the frequency of records of birds at different sites has changed with time, helping us measure upslope shifts. Here's how we did it. 
First, we extracted eBird data from Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary recorded by bird watchers. There are five birding hotspots at different elevations. We needed to take stationary checklists as mountain elevation gradients have high species turnover, as well as checklists only made in the breeding season to mitigate the effects of seasonal movements. Unfortunately, there were no checklists in the years 2010 to 2016 that satisfied this criteria. So we split our data into two time groups from 2006 to 2010 and 2016 to 2019 and analyzed these groups separately. We then saw that only two of the five sites, Bonku at 1950 meter and Lama Camp at 2350 meters, had enough numbers of checklists to draw any possible conclusions. Although just from these two sites alone, there were more than 300 species recorded with roughly 4,000 observations, most species did not have enough records to make any concrete conclusions. So we whittled the list down to about 39 common species that made up about half the total observations. We then proceeded to measure the differences in reporting frequency across the two groups for each of these species. What we expected from this was that assuming a unimodal abundance center distribution, species whose midpoints were below the hotspot elevation in the first set of years would undergo upslope shifts to bring their midpoint closer to the hotspot as the distribution shifts, recording an increase in reporting frequency, as you can see in the diagram. Similarly, for high elevation species, where the elevation of the hotspot is lower than the midpoint of the original species range, the initial high frequency of recording reduces as the distribution shifts summitwards. So if upslope shifts are happening, there should be a decreased frequency of recording. Here's a dummy plot to give you an idea of what you're going to see for our results. We have the two cases we just explored. Based on the position of the midpoint, what sort of changes in frequency would we expect to see if upslope shifts took place? On this plot, we graph distance between midpoint and hotspot versus change in reporting frequency. If upslope shifts are happening, then we should see an increase in the frequency of species whose midpoints are below the hotspot, the first quadrant that is, and a decrease in frequency for those which have their midpoints above the hotspot, the third quadrant. Let's have a look at the actual graphs. As expected, we do see a positive slope to the fits of the data, suggesting that upslope shifts are indeed taking place. Here, each dot is a species, the solid black line is a linear regression, and the gray polygon around the line is a standard error. The first graph represents 1950 meters and the second 2350 meters. The x-axis here, as I said earlier, is the difference in elevation and the y-axis change in reporting frequency. There were some species with wide ranges that were found in both hotspots. The changes in frequency, in fact, differed for these. See the white dot, for example, representing the chestnut crowned laughing thrush. Had a 40% decline at Bongpu, but only 10% at Lama Camp. As expected from our hypothesis, its elevation and midpoint is slightly higher than Lama Camp. One other thing of note is that although there is a positive slope, suggesting the upslope shifts we'd anticipated, most points in the Lama Camp graph are in the fourth quadrant, suggesting that despite moving more into the hotspot with time, there's a marked decline in their reporting frequency. This could be due to the fact that the populations are actually declining due to being pushed into the top and running out of space, or it could be due to a host of other factors at play in controlling the species ranges. These are preliminary results. We're currently trying to apply some sort of technique to link upslope shifts expected based on lapse rate with frequency using abundance as a proxy. We're hoping that using this, we'll be able to estimate the average shift of species and possibly unravel the life history traits governing the magnitude of shifts. Also, we're hoping that with time, more eBird entries will come in, allowing us to analyze these for other elevations. In the future, based on the framework outlined here, I'm hoping to extend this analysis to a global study of upslope shifts in mountain birds. Since this relies on no field data collection and relies instead on the birds observed in different places by citizens, I'm hoping that this study could bring to light extremely I... at-risk mountain uh, areas yeah. which have not what's, been studied in the past. On? There are many, many different uh, mountain ranges around the world, each with their own topographies and biotas, as you can see in the map. So identifying the effects of anthropogenic changes on species dependent on these mountains as their habitats would be a crucial cog in future conservation efforts. In conclusion, if we let global warming and other human-induced environmental changes run rampant on ecosystems, we could very well lose so many incredible species around the world. I think this cartoon from Rohan Chakravarti sums it up pretty well. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning into my talk.
All right, thank you so much for that talk. Uh, we re and apologies again for the, the slight technical difficulties. All right, so Krishna is here in case you have any questions, you can please ask your questions in the Slack channel itself and I will try to field them. I'll just wait a minute here and see if that I get any questions. Several people are typing, it tells me on Slack. <laughs> All right, so one of the questions comes, uh, did you consider any other factors in elevation in your study? Uh, not as of now. What, we, what we're doing is solely studying how the elevation has changed with time. And obviously there are a lot of different local structures and a lot of different vegetations along the mountain gradient. So it might be possible that one bird may uh, be more tied to a specific kind of vegetation while it won't, uh, another may not be and respond more strongly to climate. So we expect that on an absolute scale, these sort of factors will explain the variance in upslope shifts seen across the species. So there's a lot of scattered on that plot if you saw the uh, graph. Okay, yeah. It was a very nice talk, actually. Okay, another question is, are you also planning to look at tree diversity? Oh, we're hoping to. So uh, one of the things that we are planning to do in the future, apart from the global study that I talked about, is, well, hope for more data. Currently, we don't really have enough. But uh, what we're hoping to do is, as I said, look at the life history traits governing the shift. So if a species is strongly tied to a region that is also rich in tree diversity, maybe the longer generation time of trees might lead to a lag with respect to climate. So we can kind of quantify their temperature tracking and see how that might change. Okay, very good. And what was the volume, uh, number of records that you, you used for this study? Uh, so we had uh, 4,000 records of 30 different species of birds over like 14 years. Uh, but in the end, we could only use about 2,000 of them because they didn't fit our parameters, finally. Uh, like in terms of frequency of species, uh, we actually can't quantify if a species was seen a lot in 2006 only and there's not enough data otherwise. Okay. So, uh, for the rarer species, we had to exclude them. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, it also, is there any specific bird you were looking at in the study? And what was the reason for selecting um, Eagle Nest? Uh, nothing particular, no specific bird, just general the change in community assemblies. Um, the reason we selected Eagle Nest is because it kind of represents a very typical sort of Himalayan region. And it's number, number two is quite protected. And number three, we had sort of very concrete data on the elevational ranges of birds over there from a book uh, about the birds in the Eastern Himalayas. So uh, we were able to use that. Uh, like most scientific projects, this actually did not start off as a study of upslope shifts on birds. We started off doing something completely different uh, in Eagle Nest. And then we figured, hey, this, this is cool and it works and it shows some really cool things. So. Mm -hmm. Did you account for spatial inaccuracy and birding bias? Um, not particularly. We, we could not really because um, we don't actually know. Mm -hmm. um, th there might be some, of course. Uh, but as, as, long as, we, as long as we take like the average species, especially averaged over an uh, increasingly lengthening time scale, we're hoping that the error sort of will balance itself out. Okay. Um, is this information available online? Yeah, it's just eBird. Ah, we, all, you mean all the source of the data is available yeah, online? we just extracted yeah. the data from eBird. And, uh, correct, correct, correct. Um, do you think that their food resources are actually uh, uh, having an effect on this? Like, the, you know, changes in phenology and, and also climate? Uh, so I'd like to think there are like three or four factors at play here. So one of them is obviously the climate. The fact that there's more thermal stress means uh, foraging is harder because it's way hotter and um, you have to spend more energy and time on thermoregulation. Another factor, of course, is changes in phenology and uh, the fact that food distributions are changing. Another factor uh, which has been explored recently is rainfall, which I find personally very interesting. 
uh, that mm -hmm. increased seasonality that comes about as a result of climate change may cause the pr pr primary productivity of regions along the mountains to change. And obviously birds have a sort of bell-shaped curve with respect to a lot of factors and one of them is rain. So if there's too much rain, obviously they'll have to move. So more rain might actually induce upslope shifts as well. So there are, I think, a lot of factors at play and I think it varies from bird to bird. Very good, Krishna. Thank you. You did a great job answering questions and we really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so wonderful. So I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Um, unfortunately, he's not available on Zoom this morning, but he's here. He's actually available on Slack, so he'll take your questions offline. And Krishna, there's still some more questions for you, so hopefully you can address those on, on the Slack channel as well. Okay? Yeah, so I'll... I'll uh,